Hello everyone and welcome to Philosophy 102440 Searching for Reality. My name is Edward Matthews, that's my name right there, and my office uh, area, my office is actually A2003. Obviously right now we're online, so online until further notice. Uh, office hours, yeah, when I do have them, uh, I typically, even when I am in the office, appointments available upon request. In this particular case, I think emails will be the best way to resolve an issue. Uh, unless there's something very specific, we can meet. But for the time being, let's let's assume that we can resolve the issue you, uh, with email. And I will, uh, I will answer any and all emails that come uh, forward. Important is, of course, this, my email address emathews at fanshaonline.ca and this is uh, the one you need to hold on to uh, but again it's on the very first page of the FOL page for searching for reality. So that's really what I want to start with. I uh, want to show you that uh, this FOL page is very easy to navigate through. If you are just beginning students uh, FOL might be a little bit buggy but I just want to show you where the important material is. So first of all instructor information as I've said the most important one being my email address. Anytime I have an announcement for everyone to look at, it will be under here under announcements. The most recent one here uh, is regarding the book. Uh, the book, which is this one right here, Sophie's World, that is the book that we will be using for your readings for this course. Now, the bookstore opens and closes sort of arbitrarily, the used bookstore as well, so it's difficult to know when it is open. I would recommend calling if you wish to pick up the book as a hard copy. But what I've done here in this announcement is given you a, first of all, a link where I found a PDF drive and in a, the PDF itself of the book Sophie's Choice. If you choose not to buy it, uh, clearly you need to do the readings. The PDF is just fine. It will have all the material. It's uh, 500 and something pages long, which is the length of the book. So you're not missing anything. So having said that, the announcements, all the important ones will always be here. The next one is the one that is just below, which is basically uh, welcoming you to the course. And just to let you know what the course is about, it says here, a general introduction to the history of ideas. Yes, it is a general introduction because it does not uh, assume a knowledge of philosophy. Some of you may have taken a, a kind of philosophy course in high school, or you may have taken uh, philosophy courses in another college or even in a university. Either way, it does not assume uh, a detailed knowledge of philosophy. Now, having said that, when we work through uh, each of the modules, you'll find that uh, we seem to bounce back and forth between understanding what reality is. And the two main tendencies are the following. There is one that is called the metaphysical view of the world, and that is uh, ideas about physical reality, about inner laws, about structuring elements, about the systems that, that occur behind the scenes, as it were, to create the world that we encounter. So that is the kind of rational, metaphysical view of the world. The opposite, still the same world, but the opposite is, is an empirical, materialist view of the world. And that is basing our knowledge of the world on reality itself and the material world and moving from there. Now, big surprise, the very first philosophers, the natural philosophers that we're going to look at uh, this week and next week, already start to combine this, this, uh, this, these two tendencies. And we see f as soon as thinkers begin thinking about the world, they're thinking about what's going on behind it. And the reason for that is because, uh, as Etienne Gilson, uh, a sort of hist a historian of philosophy, uh, Etienne Gilson said that we are metaphysical creatures. In other words, we're never happy with just looking at the material world. We're always trying to push beyond this boundary, this physical boundary, to this other world, this metaphysical world. Meta means above. This metaphysical world that we think is behind the real world or reality that we encounter. So however you feel about that, this is, uh, this is the way that the world has been looked at over the last, we'll say 2,500 years either from a metaphysical point of view or from a physical or materialist point of view. So that is kind of the, the course in a nutshell in terms of these two tendencies. 
Now, as a student, you would want to ask yourself, what do I have to do? Well, the following is for you to consider in this course in order to complete it and successfully graduate from it. There will be three online quizzes during weeks three, six, and 11. Uh, there will also be a midterm test. Now, it says week seven, but likely it's going to be week six, simply because this is now a, thir a condensed 13-week course. So we may shift that one around. We're not, I'm not sure, but let's, I will give you plenty of, of uh, warning ahead of time as to what we're going to do. So keep that in mind that it could be week six or seven. Uh, then we'll have a final test and that'll be week 13 rather than week 14. Uh, and in the meantime, there'll be two essays, one essay in week seven and one essay in week 12, both worth 15%. We'll look at those in a little bit more detail. Uh, the reading schedule is also here. If you click on here, there is the course schedule and due dates, just as I spoke just a moment ago. And here are the readings. So week one, for example, introduction, the Garden of Eden, the top hat, the myths, uh, week two, natural philosophy, and the term from myth, uh, Democritus, faith, and so on. Week three, week four. So as we go through, and again, the review is not going to be week 14, but in fact, in week 13. Now, it's kind of early to tell whether we're going to need to uh, maybe knock out one of the one of the module weeks. But right now, let's see if we can get this work, uh, this work done within the time frame of 13 weeks. Uh, there is a fair amount of reading, but remember, the chapters are, are quite short uh, and, and they're fun. They're, they're, they're fun to read. They don't require, as I said, a previous knowledge of philosophy, which makes things considerably easier to, to navigate through. So this is the reading uh, list. Now, here, if you click on content, it should take you to the course information. Uh, and we have here a whole range of things, weeks one and two. For example, we have uh, ancient myth, ancient philosophy, week one. There's the PowerPoint presentation that we were about to look at shortly. Week two, early natural philosophies, uh, philosophers, sorry, Parmenides, Her Heraclitus, Empedocles, Democritus. Um, and then we have a web page with some information, uh, videos on uh, the, the um, philosophers, the most important one, Thales from uh, Miletus. Uh, video for, for week two, Heraclitus and Parmenides and Pedicles and so on. So all the information that you require for that particular module, for that particular week, will always be found in the content page. And you'll see the uh, the title well, of, the, uh, of this particular, actually, you know what, before we go any further, let's go as student, view a student. Okay, so there we go. Let's go back to content so we don't confuse the issue. There we go. Okay. So as you see, it looks essentially the same. So we have weeks one and two, three, four, five, and on. As I say, it will be, it's too early to tell whether I need to take one out for us to fit into the 13 week uh, fit, uh, sort of the schedule for this, but let's, let's work our way through the material as we, as we go along. So this is where all the content is. The evaluation is important because we have quizzes. I've opened up this quiz here. It'll, it should be uh, available and you can see it here. So online quiz, week three, covering, uh, covering weeks one and two. And if you click on that, it'll give you the uh, period now in the, it's due on October 11th. You are allowed 45 minutes. And so far, there have been no completed attempts. So. If you uh, are ready to write to the or to finish the quiz, it's right there for you. So let's go back. So this is the first one. So it tells you available October 4th until the 11th, 11.59, and there's been no attempt. So this student, myself, I've not tried to, to attempt this, uh, this quiz. The other one is the submission box. And this is important for both the first and second essay, once again, due October 5th, second one due November 29th. And again, we click on it and we see, okay, this submission will be submitted to turn it in. So what that means is every, every student's uh, nightmare turned it in, it's on. And if you wish to look at your essay, I've set it up so that you can take a look at it. 
If your essay lights up like a Christmas tree, there are some problems. Now, this is a research essay, so there will be citations. And if you quote or you cite from someone and you do it correctly, either using MLA or APA formatting, you're fine. But just don't cut and paste because Turnitin will find it. And if it's above 15% and there's no citations, you're going to be big trouble. And I don't like failing students. And I've given students breaks for, for years now. And I'm just, I, I'm getting tired that people aren't uh, doing the work because put it this way. If you're smart enough to find that information, please don't be stupid enough to not cite it. Think of it that way. You are smart enough to find that information. The least you can do is simply tell me where you found it. It's not an admission of failure. It's telling me I can research material. That's all I'm looking for. So don't hurt yourself. Just cite the material properly and you'll be fine. So when you click on it, you'll see, first of all, essay due October 25th, worth 15% of your final mark. Uh, the final mark is worth, okay, right here, the requirements. Uh, practice summarizing and explaining the skills essential to clear and successful essay writing. Uh, there is information uh, online on FOL on essay, uh, essay writing. It's not something that a lot of you are, are used to. I know that. And especially if you are, let's say you're working uh, as an electrician or welder or you're doing a practical skill, uh, you're, you tend not to write essays. If you're a law clerk or you have uh, general arts and sciences, you might be writing a few more. So there is information for students if they have if you have difficulty writing essays. Okay, so like I say, cite your sources, no plagiarism. Please do not do that and, and harm yourself. Okay, topics, choose one, answer in a roughly, roughly 1200 words. 1200 words is I think about six pages more or less. So here are some questions. Uh, the earliest philosophers were trying to explain the world around them without reference to mythology. Why was this significant? Uh, choose one or two philosophers from week one or even week two. Explain their views and what qu questions they were trying to answer. So this question, clearly, you'd want to find out, okay, what is mythology? What was its role in ancient uh, Greek times uh, in terms of answering questions about the world? Because if we are searching for reality, and we still are, if that is the case, then how did philosophy function in trying to explain what reality is? So these questions, look at them carefully. You'd be surprised, even if you break them down into their separate categories. Okay, let's say that was the first one you wanted to look at. Uh, let's say, okay, well, I need to identify what mythology is, what its role was in ancient Greece. Um, and then we have got these philosophers that are trying to not use philosophy to explain the world. Why was that important? Could that have caused some some grief, some anxiety in the average Athenian citizen to to understanding the world for pre previous to that, maybe thousands of years? The gods were doing this. The gods were mad at us. Gods and goddesses fighting amongst each other, etc. Um, yeah, if that's the case, then this is how you know th uh, thunder, uh, like a thunderstorm, was explained, or rain, or an earthquake. Now along come these natural philosophers and have uniquely different perspectives. Why was that significant? Well, because it was a radically new way to understand the world around them. So as you look at these questions, think about them. Now, you reserve the right as a student to change and modify the question slightly. If you choose to do that, let me know. And together we can kind of iron out a sort of template that you wish to work from in order for this this essay to be reasonably easy to work on. Because trust me, you can come up with something that is a great idea, but cannot even be answered in four or five or even 10 pages. On the other hand, you want to make sure that your idea is focused enough so that you can carefully and properly unpack it within five or six pages. So keep that in mind. So let's go back again here. These, uh, as I say, are the important parts of the FOL page. This is your submission folder, and it has all that information. And I just wanted to show that to you before we go any further. And again, upcoming your uh, calendar events, uh, online quiz here to October the 11th. Now, I don't know why it shows it twice. Uh, there's a spot for me to write these dates down twice. I think that's that's why. And then we also have here our first essay, second essay. So you have lots of warning. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. 
Again, there is my email address and it's also up here. So let's go and take a look at the PowerPoints for this week. Now, weeks one and two, we're going to take a look at ancient myth, ancient philosophy, because we're just basically starting out. Okay, so I mentioned to you uh, my name, uh, office, office hours, and so on. Uh, who am I in terms of a, an instructor that uh, should feel confident in teaching this course? Well, as you can see here, these are my areas of interest, uh, social and political thought, that is my MA work. Uh, Continental philosophy was my PhD work. Continental simply means Western philosophy, uh, distinct from uh, Asian philosophy or Islamic philosophy. So Continental is from, essentially from Western Europe. Uh, I have interest in social anthropology. Uh, I have uh, done work in feminist theory and gender studies. My uh, undergraduate work, my honors, I, oddly enough, was in film, film theory and production, which is where I kind of encountered all these, these folks and wanted to study them firsthand. Um, spent a year studying psychoanalytic theory, uh, which is uh, Sigmund Freud and all those folks and Lacan and the rest of them. And then finally, I have a very strong interest in literary theory, linguistics and semiotics. So that is kind of my background. So here's the book again, Searching for Reality. Uh, we are looking, uh, generally speaking, to the history of philosophy as it pertains to understanding the world. Because uh, you can take a look at philosophy from a number of different perspectives, but in Sophie's world, it is, it is essentially searching for reality. And as I mentioned on the outset, before you go searching for reality, you need to be able to answer to yourself, what is reality? What is that? And that's a question that is still being discussed. So if you're confused, we have been for 2,500 years, ever since we stepped away from using mythology to understand the world around us. So this book is uh, a, a very good overview of the main ideas that are presented in philosophy. And so what we want to start with is the beginning, right? So weeks one and two, we're going to take a look at the earliest forms of natural philosophy. Uh, mention this uh, so we don't have to go to, uh, we'll spend too much time on it. The quizzes, the midterms, the final tests, the essay outline, uh, we, you can send to me for your your essays. Um, we're going to I'm going to take a look at that and probably break that down so that it is simply incorporated into the essays. Uh, I know that learning online, it, well, will be difficult uh, because some people prefer face to face. I understand that and I want to minimize the grief and anxiety that you will encounter uh, as you work through this material, which is why I will answer all emails. Uh, I would like to find out if there's a way that we can have an online hour, a, a synchronous hour. Uh, I'm going to find out what the normal schedule for this class would have been if we were meeting and then build it around that. So I'm hoping to get this organized within uh, within the next 24 hours. So just to let you know. Okay, so philosophy is what? Well, first of all, it's it's almost a, a Greek word, philosophia. And philosophia, philo is loving or the love of something. And sophia is wisdom, knowledge. So when you put the word together, it is the love of knowledge. So philosophy or philosophia is the love of wisdom. And that is essentially what this course is about, what philosophy is about. It's also about not only the love of knowledge, but the need for knowledge, the desire for knowledge, the, the, the desire to know. How does this work? Why does this work? Why does it not work another way? Because when you come up with what we typically call a plan B, you're, you're kind of being philosophical. Let's say you're trying to work through a problem, right? Whatever it may be, you're being philosophical because you have a desire to know if something will play out. So you run alternatives in your head. So you are enjoying being able to sort of work through a, a particular set of problems and the world doesn't change in any way, but you're using your mind to argue with yourself about a particular state of affairs. So. Uh, philo philosophy is a love of knowledge <clears throat> is also the desire and the need for knowledge because it is the motivating factor behind many uh, individuals that we encounter in philosophy 
wanted to know why something is the way it is and not another. So philosophy, sure, might be hard to define, but it does involve loving wisdom and also having respect for wisdom. Because let's face it, in this day and age, on the interweb, on Facebook and other social media, apparently spending 10 minutes watching a YouTube video is equivalent to 35 years of clinical practice <clears throat> or uh, spending 25 years, you know, in, in graduate studies. No, no, it isn't. It isn't at all. And of course, the argument that people make uh, wanting, find, wanting to find alternative forms of knowledge is that, uh, you know, I'm doing my own research. Well, no, you're watching a video that somebody else has done the research and presenting to you an alternative set of facts. So the love of wisdom and philosophy is also the respect of wisdom. So let's never forget that. So wisdom, as the slides imply, is more than knowledge, right? It also tells us what we ought to do. As I mentioned, when you're working through a problem in your mind, you're trying to figure out, okay, what, what should I do? You know, what ought we to do about the following problem? Let's say something as serious as climate change. We know it is here. We, we've already passed the tipping point. We're in it. And we've been warned for years about it. And so back 10, 15 years ago, we thought about what we ought to do, right? Uh, curtail the amount of gases that go into the air. Uh, try in some way to cool the atmosphere, cool the Earth's core so that we don't have icebergs melting. So people were doing exactly that. They were thinking about what we should do and of obviously loving wisdom and respecting wisdom and scientific data in order to try to figure out what would be the best plan of action. Now, wisdom also tells us what we ought to do when we speak about morality. And we will talk about that in this course. Um, morality is about making choices. Uh, morality, for example, is the value system that you hold dear in your heart and in your mind and it can come from your parents your community your religious affiliations whatever it is it doesn't matter but it's a value system that you hold dear as to what people ought to do we should act in the following way and why is that important because when we talk about ethics which is the expression of these these value systems that's that's behavior so we ought to act in a certain way for the sake of society, for the sake of the continuation of society, whether it's, it's wearing a mask, socially distancing, or even telling the truth. All these ideas, all these aspects of life matter to us because we know that if we don't, we may have some problems. So this is, this is where the love and respect of wisdom really comes into play. So uh, should wisdom be grounded in reason or in our senses? And this is what I alluded to just a few moments ago when we first started, that wisdom, could it be grounded in reason? In other words, rationality, metaphysical ideas, or should it be grounded in our senses, in our ability to see and hear and touch and taste and all, the, all these other things? Should it start with that? Because isn't there a kind of consistency in being able to hold something in your hand as opposed to thinking about it? So... Should wisdom be grounded in reason or in the senses, in rationality or in empiricism? These are the two main ideas that we will constantly be referring to as we go through this material. So as we go through philosophy and we think about it, uh, we, we love and respect wisdom. We love and respect truth. And again, always put truth in quotations because uh, truth is what's being contested today. And we need to know that the contesting of truth often has that very real political dimension. Because depending on how you view the world and what you think is true and real, often will have a lot to do with your political leanings, whether you are leaning left or right. Um, it's unfortunate, but that is the world that we live in because everything has been politicized. What you consider to be real and true has been politicized. That's also very, very dangerous. So to get back to what we're talking about, there are two different kinds of philosophical questions that we will look at in this course. And that is, okay, what is the fundamental nature of reality? And again, I, I stress, first, you need to identify what is reality before you can ask, what is its nature, right? How should we live our lives in this reality? In this case, a social reality. And 
we cannot step outside of that because social reality is our reality. We can, uh, short of complete psychosis, we always live within that social realm. We communicate with one another. We live in communities. We interact with one another. So not only is the fundamental nature of reality important, that's the natural world, but the world in which we live in, the social world, is equally important. And that's why questions about how we live our lives is important. And then we, when we try to grasp the truth, uh, a conditional truth, a provisional truth, a situated truth, it is still something we can hold on to because we've asked ourselves, how ought we to act? And if you can answer that, that will be a kind of truth that you can work with. Now, these questions are important and interrelated because they have to do with living what's called a good life, right? And living a good life, which was something that the ancient Greeks strongly believed in. Now, keep in mind, too, that they lived in a slave state, right? The city-state was a slave state. So those individuals, mostly men, uh, had the time to sit back and, you know, put their feet up on the desk and kick back and think about what the good life was and completely ignore the fact that some people were not free. So this is what I mean. What is reality? Does it, does it, did it include slaves? Clearly at, at that time it didn't because this was a reality that simply was not even looked at or considered. So always be careful when you ask yourself, what is reality? Identify what it is first before you start talking about its, its fundamental nature. So questions about the good life. Uh, good life is in a proper moral life, a, a, a life where you can, it lets you sleep at night and have a, a clear conscience. Those questions are between that and knowing reality are very important because when we talk about morality, we're talking about sometimes metaphysical questions about the existence of God. And those issues are important when you talk about morality, because if you believe that God is looking out, right, maybe looking out for you, but also watching your behavior, then you wish to do good. Now, if that's the case, what about someone who doesn't believe in God? Or believes in a different God? What do they do? So those questions or metaphysical questions that are often linked to morality, um, they need to be articulated carefully because they need to take into account all kinds of individuals who live in all kinds of, excuse me, of different societies. Now I mentioned metaphysics, right? Uh, this notion that uh, it is beyond or after or above physics. Metaphysics is one of the two paths that we're going to take as we try to understand and search for reality. So meta means after or beyond physics. And science will often study the existence of, of natural objects. Uh, science, which is a, about climate change, science about geology, biology, all of these kinds of ologies, right, that are part of science. They're always assuming and trying to understand the existence of physical objects. And when we talk about causes, those are metaphysical uh, objects. So when we look at the thing itself and then what causes that thing to either move or grow or de develop, come into being, die away, all these questions are metaphysical questions. Because what we're trying to do is ask ourselves, you know, what these things are, what, what are they fundamentally and why do they exist? Why does this thing exist in this shape and condition and not another? So the, they're, they're questions about the world, right? They're questions about reality. Uh, metaphysical questions about God are also uh, some of the oldest ones that we know of. And uh, the, the, question, the question of God, uh, again, the pre-Socratics are some of the earliest individuals to seriously ask these questions. Now imagine, imagine somebody saying that after we've had mythology and gods and goddesses explaining the world for us and somebody, some, someone comes along uh, and asks whether God even exists or gods exist in the plural. That would be kind of one of those head blowing moments. Uh, and that's typically how the, these kinds of ideas were, uh, were encountered for the first time. Philosophers may have asked those questions, but at the same time, it was uh, it was difficult for some people to to fathom it out to to consider these kinds of things. So metaphys metaphysical questions about God are are old questions, perennial questions, 
Uh, and the question becomes, okay, can we, can we convincingly know that God exists? Or can we simply know of a being called a God? And so is, it is a question that is continually being asked because it is a question that cannot be answered in any, in any, not in a truthful way, but in a consistent way that would satisfy everyone. So metaphysics, as I've just mentioned, is concerned with what lies beyond reality. The inner laws, the inner motions of the natural world, uh, the forces that allow something to come into being and to die away, the things we cannot see except as expressions of of the laws. The fact that something that comes into being grows and then dies away tells us that there is a, a lifespan for for either animals, humans, the natural world, uh, you know, vegetation. But metaphysics tries to understand the why. It isn't just the what. Physics is the what. This is a rock. This is a tree. This is whatever. But metaphysics is the why and the how. So these questions are very, very important. So metaphysics is always concerned with the laws that control the, the natural world. Now, ontology is a part of metaphysics that deals with the nature of being, the nature of something coming into being, right? Which is becoming one thing into another. Existence itself, when that thing that comes into being is now stable and identifiable. And what is that thing called existence? Uh, reality itself, right? What is reality? How do we define it? What does it consist of? And categories of being and their relations, whether it's metaphysical being, physical being, the relationship to each other, the relationship to these laws that we believe control and inform the development, the coming into being and dying away of these things. So ontology has to do with the nature of being. And finally, the third one is epistemology, which is kind of overrides everything else because epistemology is the study of knowledge itself. It asks, what is knowledge? It also asks, can we even know anything for sure? Because epistemology is where you find truth in quotations, because it is the study of how we know what we know. And do we know what we know to be true? Again, uh, I know it sounds like we're jumping into the deep end of philosophy, but these are sort of the various, um, the various sort of realms or fields of philosophy. So metaphysics, what lies beyond reality, the metaphysical nature of the world. Ontology is the nature of the beings that we find in that world. And epistemology is, an, is about the knowledge that we derive about the study of this, these worlds. And asking, how do we know these things? How does epistemology affect my knowing something? Well, it does if I think about well, how did I learn it? Where did I learn it? Under what conditions is this knowledge correct? If I know something, if I know that unicorns exist, I have a pretty tough time explaining to people who have either never seen one or don't believe they exist or think, well, you might have just seen a funny looking horse. Um, we need to ask ourselves, how did we come to know these things? So that is very, very important in philosophy. Okay, the other aspect of philosophy, uh, and I mentioned uh, in terms of the, the good life, is the moral dimension of the world. And we ask ourselves, you know, how should we act? What is the right thing to do? So the moral, the moral principles, right, the morality that we have, the value system that we have, we need to be able to justify it. And we need to be able to justify it both to ourselves and more important, to the other individual that we interact with. Because if we cannot, if our moral principles are either corrupted or non-existent, then nothing guides our behavior. Nothing guides our ability to know that what we're doing is correct. Are we, are we using this person as a means to an end? Are we lying to this person because we wish to get something out of them or wish to convince them of something that is otherwise not true? Uh, those moral principles have a lot to do with how we behave uh, both with each other or in our community, but the world at large. Because the small things that we all do together, they all will impact the world. 
I mean, climate change is a good example. The fact that lots of people drive cars. Uh, we've accelerated something that naturally occurs in the world. We've accelerated by, by our behavior. So the moral dimension asks us to consider how should we act? If I do this, it will cause that to occur. Am I okay with that? If somebody is, is hurt or harmed in some way by my lying, or my accusing someone of doing something when, if, when I know in fact that's not true, that will of course harm someone. So the moral dimension is important for us to consider because those principles need to be justified, need to be rational, and they need to be something we can tell someone else, this is what I believe in. And if they don't, you will have to explain to them why that is so. So uh, are there objective moral rules? Uh, do we know? that there are rules that are applicable around the world? Uh, do we have a value system that is universal but is expressed differently? This would be what's called cultural relativism, the notion that cultures each express those value systems differently, but the value system is still there. So we need to know what they are. Uh, the notion of good and evil. Uh, well, we live in a, a world right now that uh, that's kind of up for grabs. Some people do things that they think, oh, well, of course, you know, we have to help the economy. But in the meantime, we're putting people at risk uh, and saying, well, no, no, you know, the economy is more important than human lives or the economy is more important than um, than an increase in pollution or a climate change. Any number of things, how people persuade and justify others about their behavior that makes issues of good and evil morally difficult, right? The morally relative. So uh, all of these issues are important in both philosophy and specifically within morality, which is a branch of philosophy. Uh, Socrates, uh, living in, uh, died in 399 BC. So let's say around the 400s uh, BC. Socrates said that an unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, a life that you don't think about. A life that you live uncritically. Uh, uh, nobody wants to live as a kind of biological entity. We wish to be able to think about the things that we do. Think about the things that we know about. So we should instead ask ourselves, what should I do? What is the right thing? What is the thing that if I were not there and somebody else were to tell someone, this is what Ed did, would I be proud to have somebody tell someone else what I've done? Or would I be embarrassed and ashamed? If you're embarrassed and ashamed, maybe you're not doing something correct or correctly. So keep those things in mind when we talk about morality as a, as a part of, of philosophy. Okay, when we are philosophizing or when we are trying to justify to others our behavior or our, our search for reality and, hey, I found it and it looks like this, right? Philosophy is not just subjective opinions. It's not watching a couple of YouTube videos and saying, mm, I'm an expert. No, what it is, is the use of reason and the use of rationality and the use of logic, the use of objective arguments. In other, in other words, objective arguments that anybody could, could understand, read and understand clearly. It's not subjectively based on who that person is, where they're from, their belief system, they are objective. Now, again, it's difficult to be truly objective because we can never step outside of our bubble. We are often influenced uh, and, and are prejudiced towards certain ideas or you know, away from others. Uh, we have biases and prejudices and sort of these kinds of things which make, make up who we are. So we need to acknowledge those. So Objective, perhaps we might put in quotations, but as much as possible, we wish to be objective. So philosophy is the use of reason, the use of logic, the use of objectivity together in order to formulate an argument that is consistent, that is logically sound. Uh, so it's not just subjective opinion. It isn't watching a couple of YouTube videos and then spewing whatever you just read. So if we try to arrive at the truth and notice here where I've put it in kind of quotations, if we arrive at truth, provisional, you know, sort of situational, whatever, if we arrive via argument, uh, we don't just use rhetorical tropes and, and you know, set up a, a straw man argument or uh, attack the person. We do it objectively. 
This is another way in which we can be objective. We we attack the idea. We don't attack what is uh, what is being discussed in terms of you know who that person is that we're talking to. So uh, if your opponent's case is carefully considered and you address each of the points that are made, then you present your own view in the best way possible in the clearest, most logical and objective way. Then the likelihood is that your argument is rational. Uh, and it uses reason, right? It re uses reason to glue the whole thing together. And that's essentially what philosophy is. So at this point now, let's, uh, let's kind of dip our, our, our toe into the beginnings of philosophy, the first philosophers. Now, I want to qualify this by saying that these are the first philosophers that we look at in Western Europe. Uh, Asian philosophy had already been uh, well underway for a few thousand years. But when we talk about sort of this Eurocentric view of philosophy, the Greeks, the ancient Greek philosophers, uh, the, are considered the first ones to write things down. That's what makes them different. Uh, prior to them, there were probably lots and lots of people with great ideas, but no one ever bothered to write it down. Why? Because in 1200 BC, when when the, the the that part of the world, the Greek world, collapsed, collapsed on all levels, economically, socially, culturally, everything was gone, including the ability of people to write down the language that they were speaking with. And this is why mythology was important, because it was a way in which through rhyming couplets and stories, people could understand the world around them. Around 750 BC, uh, this is around the time that Homer is starting to write the, Ili the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, the ancient, well, at this point ancient, but the new Greek alphabet began. So you can imagine how incredibly important this would have been, that suddenly we have the ability to write down words. We can write down our thoughts. We don't have to have them in rhyming couplets. We don't have to be like a rapper on the street corner telling us, you know, this is the this is my situation. I'm representing. I'm a, I'm talking about the streets. No, mythology was like that. It was a kind of rapper that would tell stories, ancient stories about gods and goddesses doing all kinds of things. Along comes the Greek voc vocabulary, the the Greek alphabet specifically, the ability to write down these words that allowed these first philosophers to write down their, their stories, their ideas for the first time. That's what makes them the first philosophers. They happen to be lucky enough to be around at the time when the Greek, the new Greek alphabet came into being. So quite remarkable. So ancient Greece, uh, in fact, ancient Greece didn't even, didn't even exist because uh, Greece was at that time a series of city-states. So imagine London, Toronto, Windsor are their own little entities. And of course, everything in between was just farmland. But imagine ancient Greece as simply not a country, but city states that were run autonomously, right? They had their own kings, their, sometimes their own, uh, well, certainly their own economy, their own, uh, uh, their own money, these kinds of things. Just hold on one second. Okay. Dealt with the phone call. So as I was saying, uh, in ancient Greece, which at that time were simply city-states, uh, the beginning of Western philosophy can be traced back to 600 BCE. BCE meaning before the Common Era. Uh, and so in this time period, we have uh, a number of different thinkers that are actually not even in Athens, which is where they eventually congregate, but they're living along the Western coast of what is now Turkey. And the reason why they were able to get all this information and know about parts of the world was because these were also trade routes. And trade routes are very, very important. Here, for example, is the, the map for uh, Turkey. In comparison to Greece, we can see, first of all, how close they were right in here. This is a, a blow up of this area. So you can imagine that uh, Miletus is where Thales first is uh, is known to to have lived. How close it was to Greece, and all of these these little islands and the, the land routes were all trade routes. So you could imagine, I mean, a, a, a shipping port, for example, like just a, a harbor, 
where boats would come in and they would unload their their goods and people would buy things and would talk say hey you know i heard about so and so uh, this is how information was passed on people would speak to one another about events in their own in their own countries in their own cities and of course as they were trading and the trade routes became more comprehensive and widened of course there was there was now uh, the ability to talk to more and different kinds of people about more different kinds of things so Thales from Miletus and the rest of the pre-Socratics were again not only in this unique position to use this new Greek alphabet but they were also situated as we can see in these shipping routes where these trade routes allowed people to travel back and forth with with new ideas it was a, a ver very remarkable uh, set of circumstances that allowed knowledge to grow and develop and move from one area to the next so here we have again sort of a slightly larger view where we can see Greece which is uh, the area of Greece in orange and then we have Athens I guess this is exactly where philosophy develops right there now We've got Argos, Sparta, Olympia, Delphi. Uh, we have oracles in Delphi. We've got Mount Olympus, which is allegedly where the gods and goddesses lived. But notice the Persian Empire, how close it is. Uh, Miletus, right there. Delos, again, the island of Rhodes. Knossos, which had its own developed civilization. But this is how close these people were to each other. And this is how knowledge was able to be transformed and transferred from one city to the next. Quite remarkable that all these, these conditions were met for information to be, to be transposed and developed and uh, discussed amongst very different types of people. Now, uh, for the remainder of this uh, of these slides and for this uh, this lecture, uh, we'll just talk about Thales because we'll look in more detail at Hippocrates and Parmenides and so on next week. But Thales is considered to be the first. Uh, you can see the dates: six twenty four to five forty six. So quite some time ago, and at least two hundred years before even Plato. Most people think that philosophy begins with Plato. It doesn't. It actually starts with the pre-Socratics, again, the continental Western version, starts with Thales of Miletus. And Thales was uh, a number of different things. He certainly was not a philosopher because it was only after the fact that we could identify him as such. He was actually, actually a mathematician. Now, interesting, where did he learn mathematics? From the Egyptians. He was an astronomer. Uh, he learned that from Babylonia. So as you can see, Greece was in this unique situation where because of these trade routes and the ability for them to call to speak to one another uh, and have conversations with one another they could learn these different crafts mathematics astronomy engineering all of these things were already there in surrounding areas and the Assyrian empires the Egyptian empires the Babylonian empires all of these areas fed into what we now call ancient Greek philosophy so Things like the fact that Thales could predict a solar eclipse. Can you imagine being able to do that and blowing minds saying, yep, it's going to happen tonight. And sure enough, it does. Well, you learned that from the Babylonians. So let's keep that in mind. The fact that the Greeks did not have completely original thoughts, what they did with it was highly original, but they were in this unique sort of intersection where all of these ideas were kind of coming and going and they were listening. And apparently they were naturally curious individuals. Uh, there's a historian uh, by the name of Finley, uh, M.I. Finley, excellent, excellent historian of ancient Greece. And he describes the Greeks as being just naturally gre uh, gregarious and curious and always asking questions. You know, how does this work? And how did you do this? This is, these are the people that, that were the ones that not only wanted to know, had a, remember, a love and a respect for wisdom and knowledge, but then wanted to do something with it. So uh, Thales, to get back to uh, his work, um, he did look at the world in terms of mathematical proofs, and he was able to not use mythology, but mathematics at, at various points to, to talk about uh, the sort of general rules, uh, because in mathematics, we have general rules in algebra, 
uh, Euclidean geometry, these kinds of things that I don't know about and don't want to know about uh, because I don't do very well. But at, le at least in philosophy, I understand their importance. Because remember I mentioned that ideas need to be objective. Mathematics is probably one of the most objective languages that, that there is. Because once you can prove something with mathematics, it is just numbers. Even, even a, a word can be colored in some sort of connotative way. Uh, mathematics, no. So we have someone named Thales, who even at this early point is already being incredibly objective by using mathematical formulas. He's being logically consistent, objective, reasonable. And this is how he was starting to think about the world in terms of formulas, in terms of rules, in terms of laws. And these, these kinds of ways of thinking are not only remarkable, but what, that's what distinguishes them from those that believe, believed in mythologies. This becomes one of the most important aspects of this type of thinking. Now, what was that type of thinking? Well, we have stories about gods and goddesses, and these stories were the way in which individuals understood how, how reality, how the natural world was, how it existed, what happened to it. Uh, so whether uh, disasters, uh, natural disasters, movements of the tides and things like that were always uh, explained in terms of stories that that these mythological creatures had done a particular thing and this was the cause. We could see it. So the belief in them really was not, it isn't difficult to understand how they would have believed in gods and goddesses, whether it's Zeus or Hera or any of the other ones, uh, because you could see the result. So what was happening was these particular gods and goddesses were used as the cause of something. Along comes Thales and removes these gods from the cause and looks for something else. So the effect is the same. The effect is a natural phenomenon. But the reason for that phenomenon occurring was not the behavior of gods, but in fact, the possibility of laws and rules that regulate the movement of nature. So what Thales did is he broke from mythology by looking for what's called non-supernatural explanations. So non-supernatural explanations that do not involve the gods uh, and, and their behavior, and instead an attempt to try to understand the material world on its own terms. And what Thales did and what he's known for was starting to, starting to look at the variety of reality or the, what was in the natural world and try to think about, okay, you know, is there one thing that ties all of these things together? And imagine somebody sitting and looking at, let's say, steam, and then looking at an ice cube, and then looking at a, a, a river, and going, you know, they are all the same. What do you mean, would somebody would say? Well, they're all made of water, right? Water is steam, water is an ice cube, water is a river. So... Thales begins to try to find a, a rule or a law or some sort of foundation for his thought. And this is what led him to think about water as a kind of fundamental substance. Now, this is remarkable because even the idea that something could be in all of reality, other than gods and goddesses, because he also was known to say that everything is full of gods, that's a different story. But the notion that water might be sort of a consistent aspect of all of reality was remarkable because this would be a single universal substance that also constantly changes. Because my examples of steam, an ice cube, and water, they're still water, but they come in a different form. So the idea of the changing states of water, the motion of water, the fact that living things have water, uh, that plants need water, we certainly need water. Uh, we can go for, without food for a period of time, but go without water for a week and you'll have some serious medical conditions. So Thales is thinking about water as this basic substance, as something that underlies the foundation of reality as we know it. Now, the 
idea behind sort of that single substance was one of the uh, one of the main thoughts that we attribute to Thales. The other one is the notion to, of looking at events and especially unusual events. Uh, an, imagine an earthquake. Just just for a moment, imagine an earthquake or, or a tsunami, and saying, "Okay, there is a natural phenomenon here. There's a natural explanation." This is the kind of thing that would, of course, blown minds back in ancient Greece because it's just not something that most people would understand. They would say, "No, we've done something. Uh, we we've uh, you know offended the gods. We need to kill somebody. We need a sacrifice." And along comes Thales and says, "No, this is a natural phenomenon. We don't need to kill anybody." So the fact that it was not a supernatural cause or a law that is at work behind the scenes, right? We're talking metaphysically. This is, again, remarkable for this early time. These are the first. Thales was the first and already thinking metaphysically, thinking in terms of a single substance that could tie together the world. Uh, very, very remarkable. Now, Having said that, sometimes uh, Thales said some weird things. He believed that the earth floated on this huge body of water. Now, how strange is that? Imagine standing on the Greek coastline and looking out to the Aegean Sea. You can't see the other, the other side, right? So you're thinking, yeah, it goes as far as the horizon. Maybe that is the end. Maybe we are floating on this body of water. So he didn't get everything right. But the fact that he was looking at the material world, looking at the world empirically and trying to come up with ideas about it is what makes his work so remarkable because he was not relying on mythology. Now, even though he did reject the stories of mythology, let's not kid ourselves. The gods and goddesses as such were still very important. Uh, we don't look at it in this course, but Plato was particularly uh, enamored by the gods and goddesses, maybe not so much their stories or their sometimes their rather stupid behavior, but the notion of gods and goddesses were important to him because this is what he used to build up his moral system. And this idea that things are universal, that, that they exist in, in literally the universe that we call the universe even today. That is where the gods lived. But at this time, Thales is, is presenting to us something utterly new. He's rejecting the use of mythology as a way to explain the world. This is what he does. But we don't call him an atheist because, first of all, an, uh, an atheist, that's a, that's a very new concept. That's a, that's a concept from about the 16 to 1700s. So the notion of an atheist um, is something that we are applying to Thales in hindsight. He was simply rejecting the role that the gods and goddesses had in manipulating the, the the real world and so if we are going to call him anything we would actually call him a deist a deist and we'll we'll talk about this much later a deist is someone who believes that yes the gods do exist uh, how we can prove that is secondary but is willing to concede that gods do exist and the god of a for a deist is like a watchmaker they wind up the watch and they let it go never touch it again so if Thales was anything, he was more likely a theist. And because of that, we can't really call him an atheist. But what he was doing, though, was putting gods and goddesses in a separate category. They were no longer directly uh, influencing actual real events, natural disasters, and so on. So uh, the notion that the gods were not sort of involved in our day-to-day -day affairs uh, still had to do with, you know, the soul that we had within us that was somehow connected with these gods. Uh, we, we had to be connected in some way. And that's why one of Thales' most famous statements is, is very beautiful, like everything is full of gods. In other words, uh, the world is full of wonder, right? The world is full of marvelous things and perhaps we should respect it. Maybe he was the first ecologist. Who knows? But certainly Thales was a remarkable, it's a remarkable start for natural philosophy. The fact that he's able to, for the first time, uh, compartmentalize gods and goddesses as having this kind of a role, which is a role that has to do with, with, uh, with morality, more so than direct involvement in the world, yet at the same time was not ready to dismiss him outright, uh, outright because the world still had a sense of marvel, right? And that's what he said, everything is full of gods. 
Now, some of the words that are used by Thales, like life and soul, uh, those words, especially the word, the word soul, uh, has meant different things to different people. Uh, over the last, say, few, a couple of hundred years, um, the German idealist movement, which would be about the 1800s, uh, here at this time we're talking about mind versus spirit. And spirit and soul and mind, these words have a fair amount of overlap, but at least at this point here, the notion of soul uh, had to do more so with uh, a person's being. Their, the way in which it is a totality of, of their, both their physical and the mental well-being. So the soul that something lived on, uh, if, if you believe in reincarnation, the soul would live on. Now, uh, Catholicism also, that soul lives on, but there's never been a clear, clear distinction or definition of what the soul is. We think of the mind, we think of spirit, we think of uh, what's in a person's heart versus what's in their mind or their physical, uh, you know, condition. So, as I say here, as you can imagine, the meaning of these words have changed remarkably over the last 2,500 years. Someone needs to write a book about the soul, the history of it, the history of the term. Maybe I'll do that later. Okay. The notion, too, that the world is a singular substance is also quite remarkable. And the fact that it's uh, even just making the argument in the first place, the fact that Thales was willing to step aside and not rely on mythology and mythological thinking to explain the world, but instead on reason and rationality, on empiricism and rationalism together to understand the world. That's what makes him so unique and so remarkable. Uh, Aristotle, uh, which is where we learn probably more about Thales than anywhere else, because remember, although the language language was there, the, book, the alphabet was there, there's not very much writing left over. And we learn about many of these people from secondhand information. And Aristotle was, because he was a bi biologist and a physicist, uh, had a certain respect for Thales. Even if Thales was not all the time correct, Aristotle still would cite Thales as the first true philosopher, right? Distinct from theologians, from storytellers, from poets. Uh, this is what makes Thales so unique. Because in his natural philosophy, we're not looking to the world of gods, but looking to the real, observable, material, empirical world for those answers. And this is, this is where we start. And so the natural philosophers, and that's why we call them natural philosophers, because they really think deeply about the natural world around them. And we'll find out, even at this early point, especially next week, we'll find out how quickly the ideas of the natural world evolve into metaphysics. As I mentioned at the beginning, Etchen Gilson calls us metaphysical creatures. We, we just have a natural tendency to just push ourselves to find out more. So Thales based his discoveries on observable facts, right? And there is good reason to believe that at least if we disagree with him or we, he's been proven wrong, we can at least understand how he did it. We can understand why he was able to come up with an idea like water is the only substance, the foundational sub substance. It makes sense. So we've evolved from there, but it makes sense for us at that time because remember, these individuals, part philosopher, part uh, uh, say scientist, they had no tools, no telescopes, no microscopes, no carbon-14 dating, none of this stuff. It was simply observation and thought. So for Thales, right, what did they do? They used reason and observation. Now, what that does is uh, it combines these two paths that we're going to talk about, the metaphysical and the physical, the rational and the empirical. So they use reason and observations, and they make hypotheses. I think this is the following. And he discusses it with another philosopher slash scientist slash, you know, natural philosopher and goes, no, I don't think so, Thales. So Thales has to argue and he's got to convince his listener that this is the, the way it is. So all of these ideas are developed through reason, through discussion, through observation, 
the hypotheses and so on in order to gain knowledge, right? And the most important thing is mythology is no longer being used to account for what's going on. So uh, rejecting mythology, right? And uh, the fact that it does not, or the gods don't have anything to do with our everyday life is something that is very important and very difficult for the average uh, Athenian to, to deal with. Because when you think about it, you're asking the, the Athenian citizens to break with tradition. And this is not a tradition of like, you know, 10 or 20 years. It's a couple of thousand years. And along come these people and they say, nope, I think this is the way things are. This is the way you should look at it. So it is remarkable how Thales was able to break from mythology, not rely on the gods for explanations as to why things are the way they are, instead looking at the observable world and understanding the observable world as it is. And from there, start to hypothesize on ideas about how the world actually functions. Now, there were um, followers of Thales, what they call the Melanesian school. Uh, one of them is Anaximander. And we're just going to look at a couple of these. Um, so the notion of the fundamental substance is what ties these three thinkers together. So we have Thales thinking of water as the found, fundamental or foundational substance. Uh, we have Anaximander, who argued that uh, it was not a substance per se, but what he called the epiron, right? The limitless. Uh, you could call it a life force. In the early 1900s, uh, uh, Henri Bergson called it an élan vital, right? A, a vital force, a vital life force. An Aximander called that the fundamental aspect, the foundational aspect. So the epiron, the limitless, this was this kind of energy, this uh, kind of spirit that moved through, through all living matter. And it was limitless because it never died. It, it never perished. It simply transformed. It became one thing to another. And this limitless life force was what motivated, what, what, uh, what helped the natural world to grow and develop. So the, the quote is, into that form which things take their rise, they pass away once more, as is ordained. So the coming into being and the dying away of something is just a natural cycle of the movement of this epiron, this limitless force. So that is Anaximander. So we have Thales believing water is the found, founding substance, Anaximander believing the lim, lim, limitless, lim, limitless sorry, um, force as the substance. And then we have Anaximenes who believed that it was in fact air because air could evaporate, it could, it could condense, it could, air could form with other elements. So a whole range of different ideas, a lot of talking back and forth, but what ties these three thinkers together is the fact that there was possibly a fundamental substance. Now, even when we look at the one we just had a look at before, Anaximander, okay, the epiron, the limit, limitless uh, force, already he's thinking metaphysically, right? It is something we, don't not, we do not see. We do not know the cause. We can't grasp it in our hands. We can't measure it. We can't weigh it but it is there. So Anaximander is also a metaphysical thinker as well as a physical thinker. Now Anaximenes, uh, more down to earth, more of a materialist, he chooses air as the fundamental substance. Uh, and really at the end of the day, this is what the, the school is about, trying to find this one single universal principle that underlies all of the natural world explains it's coming into being, it's dying away, it's transformations, it's ebbing and flow. Uh, it's, it's a tall order, and it's one that is still being uh, discussed and, uh, and, and reckoned with even today. So uh, in, along with uh, Thales and his school, there was also the Pythagorean school uh, with Pythagoras, this very strange mathematician who all through the ancient Greek world, he was run out of town because people were really scared of him. He was a mystic. And he believed that numbers, mathematical numbers, were the fundamental, or was the fundamental substance of the world. So it wasn't physical stuff like water or air, but in fact, the fact that the universe could be 
computed, could be measured. Now you'll see right here, there is a link. Uh, there'll be some slides with these links, but you can certainly have a look at them. The notion that the universe is computational. Uh, all of these ideas are important to develop science. Even if they're wrong, they start somewhere. They're asking the right questions. Because if the universe isn't predictable and orderly, and if the movement of atoms is merely random rather than necessary, uh, if that's the case, if it is, if it's not predictable and orderly, then how can we search for universal laws and rules that measure and define and control the world? So this is a very, very important question. We have to be able to ask ourselves, is the universe predictable? Because if it isn't, then we cannot come up with laws to explain its functioning. So I will leave you with that. Uh, I will figure out what we're going to do for a one hour uh, in sort of live synchronous uh, hour. Uh, I will let you know by hopefully by the end of today. I'm waiting to hear back from my department uh, to know what the schedule is. But in the meantime, thank you for your attention. Uh, essentially, this is how we're going to do it from week to week. And then hopefully we will have a chance to have our uh, one hour live. And I will let you know as soon as possible. In the meantime, take care and we'll talk to you soon.